practice, dear friends. I hope you're uh, all around the world are well and safe in these strange and challenging times. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this first high level meeting of the Blue Road to COP26, where today's topic is financing ocean based climate solutions. The Blue Road will convene key stakeholders from the private sector, the UN government, the UN governments, NGOs, science and academia to assess how business and policy can take action and advance global, uh, global climate goals through harnessing ocean-based solutions. These dialogues will serve to pro provide input for a set of recommendations to be presented at COP26 on the role of the ocean in climate action. COP26 represents a critical milestone for emission reductions, and this is a pivotal year for climate action to put the world on a 1.5 degree trajectory. The acceleration of ocean-based climate solutions can play a crucial role in supporting the COP26 priorities and the targets set in the Paris Agreement. And for the first time, this year's COP26, there will be a dedicated ocean lead within the UNFCCC high-level climate champions. The creation of this new role sends a strong statement on the importance of the ocean in addressing climate change. So it is with great pleasure I welcome my colleague, Monsieur Ignace Begin Bilcock, who will serve as a lead ocean and coastal zone for the high level climate champions to deliver the opening remarks for today's session. So Ignace, you have the floor. Thank you, Stiola. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today in my new role of Ocean Lead for the UNFCCC Climate Champions. As we rebuild from the COVID-19 pandemic, COP26 is a defining moment to meet the world's goals of halving carbon emission in the next decade so that the world can achieve net zero emission by 2050. In this journey, ocean-based climate solutions have a critical role. But while climate change is having a devastating effect on coastal communities, coral reefs, and sea lives, recent analyses show that the ocean can also be a source of solution and hope in fighting climate change. Already, the ocean has taken the brunt of human-made climate change, absorbing 93% of heat trapped by rising greenhouse gas emission and taking up to 30% of our carbon emissions. In addition, ocean-based solutions such as sustainable seafood production, zero emission shipping, offshore wind, or the high potential of seaweed can reduce the emission gap by up to 21% in order to keep temperature rise to 1.5 degree by 2050. At COP25 in 2019, Member states highlighted the importance of the ocean in the fight against climate change and launched an official process to strengthen linkages between climate and ocean policies. In my new role, building on the work of the UN Global Compact Sustainable Ocean Business Action Platform and with many other partners, I will mobilize companies and key stakeholders to take climate action and align their activities with the net zero targets. By taking such action and commitment, companies will show that they are preparing their business for the future and already seizing the right business opportunities. This global engagement of non-state actors is also crucial to encourage governments to be ambitious and enhance their NDCs, demonstrating that the market is ready and solution can be de deployed at scale is crucial. When policymakers and businesses push each other on climate change, the resulting ambition loop unlock maximum potential for impact and innovation. As part of this effort to see more ambition loops worldwide, companies should step up by joining two races. The first one is a race to resilience. This race is aiming to deliver a step change in global ambition for climate resilience, putting people and nature first in pursuit of a resilient world where we don't just survive climate shocks and stresses, 
but also thrive in spite of them. Coastal zones are at the core of this mobilization. 40% of the world's population is living in coastal areas and directly facing the result of climate change with sea level increase, floods, and extreme weather conditions. The protection of natural ecosystems, such as mangrove or coral reefs, have the potential to help safeguard coastal cities, communities, and businesses. Investing in climate resilience and adaptation is smart economics. For example, protecting and restoring mangrove globally at a cost of $100 billion, which already a lot, could create one trillion in net benefits by 2030. In addition to adapting to climate change, the priority is also to drastically cut greenhouse gas emissions. For this, the race to zero is mobilizing companies, cities, states, region, investors, committed to halving emissions by 2030 and achieving net zero emissions as soon as possible and by 2050 at the very latest. Commitment under the Race to Zero Alliance no cover just half of the global GDP, a quarter of CO2 emission and a third of the population. So the path to a radical change is here, but more needs to be done. One way to join this new growth and innovation agenda is to commit to the business ambition for 1.5 degree initiative. This initiative challenges companies to set science-based target for reduced emission in line with the 1.5 trajectory. To date, more than 1300 companies have joined the business ambition for 1.5 initiative, and they represent together $1.6 trillion in market get capitalization. We are now in the critical decade where we can still choose a better future when nature and humankind thrive together. All together, we must help government picture what this future looks like by harnessing the power of the real economy to demonstrate that the necessary system transformation are already happening and accelerating exponentially. So my message today is join the races and be part of the solution. I very much look forward to work with you all in my new role and with the UN Global Compact to turn the tide of climate by making the ocean and ocean businesses part of the solution. I thank you very much. Thank you, Nas, for outlining a clear vision for the ocean to support the COP26 priorities. We wish you good luck in your important new role. The US Special Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, recently emphasized that the interconnected nature of ocean and planetary health by saying, you cannot protect the ocean without solving climate change, and you cannot solve climate change without protecting the ocean. Countries need to incorporate ocean-based climate solutions in their nationally determined contributions, the so-called NDCs, and that will be the overarching aim of our blue road to COP26. UN Climate Change recently published the initial NDC synthesis report, which shows that nations must submit stronger, more ambitious national climate action plans this year. And that is this year, if we are to achieve the goals set in the Paris Agreement. In the global transition to a net zero resilient economy, low carbon maritime transport and sustainable seafood, offshore renewable energy and nature-based ocean solutions represent critical enablers. Our opening panel today will provide insight on how governments can set clear vision set, uh, on their national strategies to expand the sustainable blue economy. According to the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, investing 2.8 trillion US dollars today in just four ocean-based solutions, offshore wind production, sustainable ocean-based food production, decarbonization of international shipping, and conservation and restoration of mangroves would yield a net benefit of 15.5 trillion US dollars by 2050. And that I think is a pretty impressive return on investment. 
The Ocean Panel emphasizes that effective protection, sustainable production, and equitable prosperity go hand in hand to create a triple win for people, nature, and the economy. Now it's my great privilege to welcome Ms. Helena Vieira, Director General of Maritime Policy to the Minister of the Sea, Portugal, a member of the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. The Ocean Panel has recognized that production is just as important as protection when it comes to managing the ocean and mitigating climate change. So how can we embed this narrative, which incorporates the need for production in upcoming political ambitions? Ms. Vieira, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all from uh, sunny Lisbon here. Dear Minister of Belize, dear directors, dear CEOs and CFOs, dear participants, it is with great pleasure and much honor that I participate in this event as a representative of the Ministry of the Sea of Portugal. Portugal is actually, like you mentioned, one of the 14 countries that founded the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. The panel has the main goal of setting a transformative agenda for a sustainable ocean economy where protection, production and prosperity go hand in hand. The agenda and the commitment set by the panel aims to bring together knowledge and technology, conservation and resources management, citizens engagement, financing and governments, all aligned with the 2030 agenda and the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And we hope as a panel to set an example for an ambitious turning point. Uh, we aim to go further than just a political compromise. The panel is utterly action-driven and solution-seeker uh, mode. To that end, the panel has produced over 20 reports that offer concrete solutions, including some in addressing our commitment to management, managing the ocean and mitigating climate change. So the panel political ambitions develop around five important areas, all equally important. Area number one, ocean wealth, or like you said, production and prosperity, recognizing that the ocean produces around 2.5 trillion US dollars in goods and services every year. This contributes immensely to the economy and the livelihood of a vast number of communities. To this regard, along with areas such as food from the ocean, tourism and transport, traditionally considered more conservative, I would like to highlight the new ocean industries, the ones that include vast opportunities to deliver medicines, animal feed, fuel, or new materials. The second area is ocean health, with the emphasis on clearly protecting, including sustainable management of the ocean space and climate change mitigation. In fact, a number of coalitions and calls have been established or are in the process of being formed, bringing together public sector, companies, and NGOs, and others. One of these calls is the Ocean Panel's call to ocean-based climate action, with the goal to scale up investments in ocean-based renewable energy, green shipping, sustainable seafood production, nature-based solutions, and carbon capture and storage. A third area relates to ocean equity, because the panel clearly affirms that a sustainable ocean economy cannot be achieved while inequality persists. The fourth area is ocean knowledge, critical to boost ocean wealth. And finally, and more uh, focused to the point here today, the fifth area, ocean finance. In this regard, and with the aim of financing ocean-based climate solutions, direct public sector financing and unlocking private sector financing is crucial to achieve our goals, to de-risk investments, and then create a focused blended finance capacity in the countries to really imp implement. The work of the Ocean Panel and the ambition behind it are very much aligned with the work being done by the Portuguese government. So we recently designed our new National Ocean Strategy 2030. This strategy was developed under a clearly transformative vision in comparison to previous strategies, aligned today with the mindset of the event here. And this vision states that we must protect and promote a healthy ocean as the only means to leverage a sustainable blue development for Portuguese well-being, but also a vision to consolidate Portugal as a global leader in ocean governance supported in scientific knowledge. Under this new national ocean strategy, Portugal defined 10 strategic goals for the decade, where, for example, the first one is focused on fighting climate change, pollution, and restoration of ocean ecosystems. 
We have then clearly identified 13 top priority areas for intervention to achieve such goals, where we included, for example, bioeconomy activities and other decarbonizing sectors of ocean economy. These will be the main areas where the ocean can play or must play a role in achieving the, desirable, the desired sustainable development for Portugal in the next decade. But to implement such ambitious goals, Portugal is focused on continuing the work done so far in financing the right ocean-based climate solutions. Using the public financial instruments available in the country, we are prioritizing support and financing to innovative ocean-based projects and investments that can have a positive impact or even recover marine ecosystems. Examples are seaforestation projects that use this concept as a new business model, fully circular integrated multi-trophic aquaculture concepts, ocean renewable energies, marine biotech to fight 21st disease, diseases like COVID-19, or even new businesses and projects being developed around marine ecosystem services like marine grasslands and blue carbon capture services. A final example we would like to point out is the recently created instrument, Portugal Blue, a fund of funds developed between the Portuguese Blue Fund, a governmental fund, and the European Investment Fund to invest specifically in sustainable blue economy projects and climate mitigation innovations, obeying to the sustainable financing principles. The Portugal Blue Fund will contribute in a blended mechanism with 50 million euros of public money and an additional 25 millions of private funds to invest and generate the next decade of transformative ocean-based solutions to today's problems and challenges. It is therefore fair to state that we, in Portugal, aligned with the Ocean Panel view, believe that the blue economy will have a pivotal role in the sustainable development we need for the next decade. And for this to happen, we must continue directing public sector financing and developing assistant and de-risking mechanisms to unlock private sector financing for the blue economy we need to foster a global greener and bluer future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Vera, for these very interesting uh, and thoughtful comments. And good luck with your ambitious and comprehensive uh, uh, 10 goals and 13 uh, priorities, uh, indeed. Now, I'm pleased to welcome our next speaker, Mrs. Candy Carrillo, CEO of the recently established Ministry of the Blue Economy in Belize. Even in these early days, you have been extremely active and laid the foundation for more coordinated ocean management to benefit the Belize economy. So our question to you is how your work can attract funding to propel the blue economy. Ms. Ms. Carilio, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the Minister of Blue Economy and Civil Aviation, I extend um, greetings from Belize and gratitude for the opportunity to, at such an early stage, be able to join um, all of you who have been involved for so um, such an important time in our global um, growth as a blue global um, country, we are very much excited that in four months, um, when the new government took office, they gave a very clear mandate because there was a strong conviction that blue economy would be an important catalyst for our economy in Belize at this time. We know that globally we are all confronting so many challenges and I am privileged that um, we were able to be invited to be a part of the team that would pioneer Belize's blue economy. And we have really hit the ground running working um, very very diligently with our partners. It is important for us to acknowledge that even though the ministry is new, obviously blue economy is not new to Belize. Um, a lot of work has been taking place through our fisheries department, uh, which is recognized as one of the most progressive in the region, as well as um, the Coastal Zone Management Institute. And so we are Definitely um, working with these key departments as the core of what we're looking to establish. Belize's vision for its blue economy already um, defined is that by the year 2030, we expect a productive, resilient and vibrant blue economy contributing substantially to the socioeconomic well-being of the country and its people. 
and our mission is to increase gross domestic product through a thriving blue economy development pathway that is harmonized, innovative, and socially just, supported by a robust science-based management regime of our aquatic resources and spaces to improve the livelihood of all Belizeans. Our key guiding principles are good governance, blue justice, socially and economically um, beneficial, sustainable and environmentally responsible, and of course, ecosystem-based management. Key priorities include the development of a five-year national blue economy strategy and plan, a plan that will bring together multi-sectoral partners in a response to the blue economy um, strategy that we are in the process of developing. We're developing a strategic roadmap for the implementation of the strategy and the plan, in-depth policy and institutional capacity building to inform the requisite enabling environment and institutional architecture for an aquatic ocean-based economy. Establish of establishment of a multi-sectoral country coordinating mechanism to support mainstreaming integration and development of the blue economy. I must highlight that this um, multi-sectoral approach is extremely important. We recognize it as a solid foundation to ensure inclusivity and ownership of the blue economy at all levels of our blue economy. Development of a blue economy plan for Belize's blue and aquatic Insurance curve as our core. We know that it is recognized that a marine special plan is essential for implementing the blue economy in Belize. And in we've had um, the Belize Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan that was developed in 2016. And we it was actually hailed by UNESCO uh, World Heritage Center and one of as one of the most forward-thinking ocean management plans in the world. And we are very happy now that as a blue economy, we're able to build on this plan. It's a planning framework for national action to facilitate improved management of coastal and marine ecosystems so as to maintain their integrity while ensuring the delivery of ecosystem service benefits in perpetuity for present and future generations of Belizeans and the global community. In terms of coastal capital for Belize, we are seeing tourism at 196 million per year, fisheries 16 million, shoreline protection 231 to 347 million, great potential as um, indicated in, 20, in, in 2009. Of course, all of this information now, we will be using to, to build on what we have as our plan, which includes a framework of four strategic objectives to ensure the one, sustainable one use. One minute, Ms. Carillo. Sure. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Please, uh, please you have uh, one minute. Uh, uh. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for letting me know that. I just want to, in this one minute, um, just to highlight that opportunities that exist are plans for broader areas of an entire ocean and aquatic waters of Belize, territorial EEZ and inland water bodies, blue economy spatial plan to support the national blue economy pathway to facilitate private sector, conservation, government and community actors, participation in the national blue growth initiatives and programs, opportunities to integrate new emerging economic activities, and strengthening of management and conservation goals, focus on the ocean as a solution to climate change with a shift to climate resilient solutions, protected areas management effectiveness and expansion, community innovation and resiliency, development of other areas of the blue economy, such as renewable energy, nature-based solutions for adaptation and mitigation, and harnessing carbon through blue carbon and conservation of key ecosystems, such as mangroves and seagrass. And lastly, of course, climate smarting the development and productive sectors within the blue economy and promoting low carbon solutions 
in the blue sector. I thank you so much. Our excitement wants us to share a lot more slides, but we will, for this moment, end at this. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Carillo. Uh, this was really a very informative and inspiring presentation. And I think that it's, uh, it's very impressive. Uh, the, the framework uh, that you have developed for such a uh, holistic approach to ocean management. So thank you so much. Um, next, I would like to introduce Mr. Gregory Watson, advisor at the Inter-American Development Bank's Climate Change and Sustainable Development Department, responsible for leading bank work on biodiversity and natural capital. I guess, uh, Gregory, that you must have a pretty busy business card. But uh, more importantly, could you explain to us how the Inter-American Development Bank is incorporating blue into recovery plans? Nature-based solutions will play a significant role in many countries meeting their climate goals. And how are you facilitating the financing of these uh, solutions? Please. Thank you, Sterla, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, and I couldn't have planned it better. I didn't pre-organize pre with my colleague from Belize, but um, what I'd like to do is maybe zoom out a little bit from the Belize example to what we see at the regional level and zoom back in on a few uh, specific projects or examples of finance. But you know, to start, um, looking at why does the bank look at this issue? The bank is focused on making the lives of people in Latin America and the Caribbean better. And to do that, we have to ensure that development is sustainable and inclusive. And if you look at Latin America and the Caribbean, it's a region of oceans. 25% of the population lives on or near the coast um, and almost 100% in the Caribbean. Um, and then roughly the ocean provides about $21 billion in GDP to the region. And so we try to talk about this concept of blue economy encapsulating the ideas of innovation, integration, inclusion, and sustainability when we talk with our member uh, countries. Across the region, specifically in Central America and Caribbean, especially um, with the COVID pandemic, we need to work with governments and actors to find innovative solutions for both finance and for um, getting people back to work and for development. And the blue economy concept is really useful and innovative to broaden the development thinking beyond terrestrial and coastal spaces because it shifts the traditional mindset for development away from just thinking about what happens on land to what happens on the surrounding ocean. Um, and we see that countries are moving from thinking only about energy, transport, industry, and land use to thinking about offshore energy, shipping, fisheries, and looking at the fact that tourism in most countries is inherently dependent on the ocean. Um, and so if we can shift this blue economy thinking, it can drive development in a whole integrated, um, you know, whole of government approach. And we're trying to do the same thing at the bank, have a whole of bank approach to this topic. Um, especially for small countries, uh, they're very small in their terrestrial area. They have few terrestrial resources and they're a long way from markets and economies of scale. And so that's the classic kind of small country challenge. But when you start to look at the surrounding ocean area, a lot more resources become clear. Um, the wind energy generation to shipping and all of the other topics that we just talked about. And I will I'll save a little time by not going into them. But it shows that this really can broaden the way you look at the resource base and the employment base of the country. So, you know, in summary, if we want to address the challenges of scale to create successful economies, we need to be looking at both of these together at the same time. Um, if you start to look at, at the climate challenge, you know, and COVID recovery, we're looking at how do we get people back to work? How do we make countries more resilient? And how do we reduce carbon? And blue economy is a really useful way to do this. Um, we can look at opportunities beyond near shore tourism and fisheries to think about different values, to think about as, the, as uh, Portugal was mentioning, biotech, um, you know, blue carbon capture, uh, and a number of these other topics, and also looking at nature-based solutions and infrastructure. Um, so we're taking an increasing role in advancing this blue economy con uh, construct. Um, we worked in Belize in the past, and, and I, I won't go into some of that, but we're starting to work in Costa Rica, for example, on the blue recovery plan for the country where they're looking to recover from COVID, how do they get reactivate these, these areas? And we're funding the development of specific project proposals that can attract public and private finance and mapping what those are for the kind of sustainable recovery ocean uh, uh, sector. In the Bahamas, we helped to consider nature-based solutions in the development of Andros Island, both coastal functions I mean, national planning and resilience. And um, we're also working on blue economy roadmaps in you know, Barbados, Bahamas, and Tobago. And we've supported policy loans that are linked to the blue economy. So for example, in the Bahamas, the policy loan supports marine protected areas and business competitiveness and resilience. And we also are looking at reefs. 
Um, we've just completed a valuation of the Mesoamerican reef. We know that reefs can um, you know, uh, serve as a really important factor for uh, avoiding coastal flooding. They mitigate up to 75% of the damage of wave action. Um, and you know, we've actually valued that, that across different areas, working with the Ocean Risk Resilience Action Alliance and insurance companies so that you can create insurance products for coral reefs as natural infrastructure and then distribute that benefit to different public and private actors so the premium can be sent to different uh, kinds of actors. And so that's some of the kinds of models we're looking at. Um, you know, and then just quickly closing, because I know we don't have much time. Um, you know, another way is to look at future innovation with the private sector. Um, so we're working with the UK government with a special fund for blue carbon, uh, looking at mangroves. And in, for example, Panama, we've created a coalition of the airport, the water treatment authority, coastal landholders, shrimp farms, uh, local lower income populations, all who are pushing for inclusion of mangroves in the NDC, but also creating a sustainable finance mechanism for the restoration of the mangrove habitat. And we're doing the same thing in Colombia, linked to sustainable cities. And then just kind of very quickly, to close two last points, we're also looking at debt for nature deals um, in various countries where a protection of marine environment, avoid, avoidance of runoff um, and uh, support to different kinds of marine sectors can be part of the um, payment for results that basically would make a debt for nature deal work. Um, and we're also, we're, our IDB lab has invested in uh, the Alphelia Sustainable Ocean Fund um, to try to work with those actual entrepreneurs on the ground uh, with seed capital and equity financing up front so that we have more entrepreneurs taking a shot in this sector and build that pipeline that can actually be developed for scale in the future. So I know we're running short on time, so I think I'll stop there, but I'm um, happy to kind of engage bilaterally with anybody in the Thank you. Thank you so much, Gregory. And that was a really a great presentation. And thanks for also connecting your uh, this uh, uh, topic to to how to build back better in a post-pandemic world. Very, uh, very interesting. And this is also an excellent uh, segue to the next session because it's now my pleasure to pass on the baton to my highly esteemed colleague, Mr. Eric Yashki. He's uh, UNGC head of sustainable ocean business and he is to moderate the session addressing how to drive sustainable ocean business ambitions. So, Eric. Thank you, Sula, and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. And I think it's been a great opening with a big picture of the broad brush strokes uh, with important frameworks to grow the blue economy, very clear ambitions and targets. But we also know in the UN Global Compact that without the private sector, it's going to be hard to innovate, invest and operate the sustainable blue solutions. And that's why it's a special pleasure for us here today to introduce to you Sema Sejem and, and uh, the CEO, uh, Mr. Rodolfo Sade, who would like to share uh, some new project with us, if I have understood it right, that I think could spark some interest in really implementing real solutions to the market. So, uh, Mr. Sade, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric, and good afternoon, everyone. This uh, COVID pandemic follows several crises during the last years. It shows the fragility of the current world. We need to set a long-term objectives to be carbon neutral by 2050. But at the same time, we must act now by implementing all solutions currently available on industrial scale. So solutions do exist. We as CMA CGM have already reduced our CO2 emissions by 6% in 2019 and 4% in 2020. Six months ago, we have deployed the first 23,000 TU container vessels propelled with LNG. It took us seven years of research and development, allowing us to reduce by minus 99% of fine particles and SOx emissions, and up to 20% less of CO2 emissions. By 2022, our company will be operating a fleet of 32 LNG vessels. Today, I am pleased to announce that from May 2021, we are launching the first low carbon maritime service offering based on biomethane. It allows us to decarbonize the transport in a significant way. 
a reduction by at least 67% of CO2 emissions and up to 88% at ship level. It's a major step forward towards carbon neutrality. This uh, initiative will allow us to deploy services on intra-European trades and essentially the Baltic Sea. What is biomethane? Biomethane is a renewable gas produced from organic waste from European farms. It's compatible with the engines of our LNG vessels. It's a new market for farmers and a great example of circular economy. We will be securing 12,000 tons of biomethane for this first year, covering the needs of our intra-European trade. We aim to support the development of biogas and are ready to invest in modernization of sites. Thank you, Mr. Rodolfson. That is uh, interesting news. And I, I think it's quite significant that a company like your own is investing in the value chain to secure sustainable biofuel or bi biomethane uh, that is uh, uh, securing that this project actually can run um, uh, on a sustainable uh, biomethane. Um, if I could ask you a follow-up question, now that you have shared your short-term plans, what is your long-term perspective for uh, and ambitions for CMR, CGM, and the broader shipping industry? I mean, some has called the, the, the shipping industry for carbon captive, but there are solutions. And what is your perspective on this? What I will say, Eric, is that it's a still long way to go to meet the commitments of the Paris Agreement but we have no choice, we need to act. Achieving these goals does not rely only on one solution, but a set of initiatives and new technologies that will complement uh, one another. Mm. We need to keep up our efforts and continue the research and development for other set energies that will be applicable in the medium term. We are already looking at different energies, hydrogen, ammonia, which are long-term solutions. To accelerate this research and development, we need to work all together. And this is critical if we want to achieve goals. We have decided to set up a coalition of the energies of the future. We have 18 members, companies from around the world that have decided to join uh, forces. And this coalition is working on seven concrete projects to accelerate the energy transition. Mm. What will be the vessel of tomorrow? This honestly, I do not know. But what I can say is that I don't believe in promises. What is important is we need to act now. Solutions do exist, so it is possible. And at the same time, I'm also confident by all joining forces, we will be able to take up this big challenge with our partners, suppliers, and customers that also share the same ambitions. Thank you. Thank you so much again, uh, Mr. Sadeh. And I think it's a huge undertaking. And as I said, it's important for that the private sector invest, invent, and operate new solutions. And I'm also glad to hear that it's in a very collaborative mood. We heard that from uh, uh, Inas uh, Bilkok uh, from the UNFCCC that the COP26 will be about collaborating with the private sector and the public sector, sharing a round table and discussing concrete actions that we can take now, but also the long-term ambitions that we also heard from the previous speakers. So again, thank you for taking part and sharing this uh, great news with us at this uh, World Bank uh, side event. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sade. Thank you. Uh, moving forward, uh, before I give the floor to my colleague, Suzanne Johnson, who will moderate uh, the next panel, I would just like to remind you that at the UN Global Compact for the last few years, what we have really tried to do is to set a baseline of expectations we launched in 2019 the Sustainable Ocean Principles at the UN General Assembly. It's a tool for the private sector to sign up and show that they are committed to sustainable ocean business, that they are aware of their environmental, social and economic footprint and good governance. Uh, check that out. I think it's an important first step, but we also need 
positive, strong amb ambitions. It's not only about doing no, do no harm. We also need to do good. And there are lots of do good opportunities in the oceans if we do it right. And that's why we launched the Ocean Stewardship 2030 uh, report just over a year ago. And every year at the UN General Assembly, we will take stock and look ahead. Where are we going? How can the ocean industries deliver on the 17 SDGs? To do that, we need finance. And that is what we're going to discuss here today. We need public finance, we need private finance, blended finance, and we need bonds and equity. And we launched a blue bond paper last year. And I know there is a slate of blue bonds uh, coming out to the market, targeting projects or companies that are actually setting a KPI on their positive impact on the planet at large, being an ocean industry company or an industry project. Uh, we are also uh, working across the UN on these issues. And we work with uh, the World Bank system, of course, and we work with UNEP-FI, and they have made a great guide on how to finance the blue economy. It's not an easy way. There are so many UN entities working on this. There's so diverse and complex uh, industries trying to solve these issues. Mm -hmm. issues from plastic to antibiotics, to renewable energy, to hydrogen, as we heard, biomethanol infrastructure value change that needs to be addressed. Super interesting paper from the UNFI, and I'm sure you will find that in the link uh, in the chat. And, and please use the chat. Uh, I don't know if we will have time to answer all the questions, but we are here to be inclusive and, and have as many voices, as many voices heard as possible. With that said, uh, it's my honor to give the floor uh, to my good colleague, Suzanne Johnson, who will moderate the next panel. So please, Suzanne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric, and thanks to so many of you online today who are involved in important initiatives around the blue economy. It's great to see all your voices in the chat. Uh, we're now honored to be joined, though, by a panel of leaders from the finance value chain. And um, they've been working very hard to get the private sector to fund the private sector sustainable activities. Um, I'd like to ask each of you today to share your perspective on what are the key elements needed to accelerate investment in the sustainable blue economy and support a net zero future. So first I'd like to join to Mr. James Scriven, who's the CEO of IDB Invest and our co-host for today's event. Um, he's also a strong partner in our work on blue bonds. And uh, James, you're the head of the private sector arm of the Inter-American Development Bank and the support of the multilateral financial institutions like IDB Invest was essential in building the credibility of green bonds uh, about starting 10 years ago. So my question for you is, how do you see IDB Invest helping to grow blue finance? And uh, in your view, actually, what in particular needs to be done to accelerate investment in the blue economy? Mr. Scriven, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Susan. It's a real pleasure to be part of, of this event, uh, very dear to my heart. Um, this, is a, this event is a great example of the strong partnership that IDB Invest and the UN Global Compact have. Let me start by giving some context to the audience. As a multilateral development bank, IDB Invest is committed to sustainable development of member countries of Latin America and the Caribbean through the private sector. We seek to support the growth and innovation of our clients, and we do it through projects that achieve financial results while maximizing economic, social, and environment development, developments in our region. A region, Latin America and the Caribbean, that has unfortunately been hit by COVID-19 harder than other regions in the world. Even though we account for only 8.4% of the population of the world, we have close to 30% of the deaths as a product of, or of a, as a consequence of COVID-19. In average, our economies have, have contracted 7.7% and, and almost 3 million companies closed in 2020 due to the health crisis. This job loss is, is essentially affecting more women and also 108 million women and girls will be left in poverty as a consequence of this pandemic. In this context, IDB Invest has been working to achieve the consequence to reignite economies after a hard 2020 
and with the hope of a vaccine, we see 2021 as a starting point, as a recovery point, as an inflection point. We believe in a green and inclusive recovery led by the private sector. And my comments will be in the context of that. Following this goal, IDB Invest is positioning blue bonds in the region as an innovative financial instruments. The blue economy encompasses a sustainable use of oceans, resources for economy growth, as well as ocean ecosystem health. In fact, the blue economy contributes to all 17 SDGs by financing a track, attractive ocean and water related solution across a number of sectors. This is valued in $3 trillion per year. With nearly 25% of the population living on the coast, the blue economy is essential for sustainable businesses in Latin America. The Caribbean region particularly presents a clear business opportunity for blue bonds and blue investments. While green and other sustainable bonds concepts are rapidly expanded, blue bonds are still in nascent phase where there is an increasing demand for common, common agreed references and guidelines to structure and measure impact. We hold financing and thematic experience across all sectors and segments, and we can begin introducing a transition to blue business practices and financing. This is an important blue bond characteristic to find in mind, especially if they are related to ocean health, such as operations and input needs to enable them come to improve practices and land businesses. For example, consumer packages, good design for waste reduction, SME sustainable practices to increase value chains resilience, and agribusiness reduction of agrochemicals runoff. IDB Invest supports companies in Latin America to access capital markets, uh, mobilize investors and promote thematic bonds. With a framework for blue bonds defining the requirement of the use of proceeds, and measurable results, IDB Invest can both support its clients to prepare for blue investments as well as finance and mobilize. We also expect that the blue bond framework will create innovation in business models and practices, not only catering to mitigating effects of climate change, but also nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation, waste reduction, and overall ocean economics. This framework will also contribute to social inclusion, economic empowerment, and, the, and value chains and its surrounding. Aim to lead the analysis of, about this financial markets product of the region, IDB Invest collaborated with the UN Global Compact in developing a blue bond reference paper customized for Latin America. This work has, has involved engaging leading asset managers, banks to provide their insights on developing a framework that can be useful and scalable across regions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, it's, um, it's, it's, there's no doubt that IDB Invest is gonna play an important part in starting the cornerstones of building blue finance in the Latin American and Caribbean region. So thank you very much for that. Um, let's go to now to hear from the investment banking and structuring side um, to build on what Mr. Scriven was saying. And um, today we're going to turn to Yu Pessels, who's the Director of Sustainable Bond Finance at ABN AMRO. Um, and ABN AMRO has been an active mem member of our ocean platform and is a signatory to the Sustainable Ocean Principles. You, you've structured numerous green social and sustainability bonds. And given your extensive experience, how do you see the blue bond market developing? And also how can the blue bond guidelines like such as James Scriven um, recommended, um, how can they help issuers and investors? You, over mm -hmm. to you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks Suzanne. Um, Yeah, first of all, um, we have seen a tremendous growth. It's very much driven by investor demand. Uh, and I think that was also, um, yeah, I think that, that that was key essential for the growth of the market uh, and started with actual issuance from the World Bank and, and parties like EIB. Um, 
the blue bond market as it stands now reminds me a bit of, of 2015 when ABN AMRO as a bank uh, issued their first uh, European green bond. Um, that was a very big success. It was also the first example of, of a bank stepping into this world, at least in, in, in our area. Um, and it triggered many, many questions, very often very practical questions uh, from, from, from peers, like how, how did you do do it? Uh, how do you decide on criteria? How do you measure and report on it internally? Um, and every every bank, every bond uh, which, which have been uh, um, issued in a new country or in a new sector um, um, that triggered action from, from peers. And we've also seen that on the, on the sovereign side. Uh, when the first green bond from a sovereign came out, all the other sovereigns started to follow. And I think that is, that is something which I would expect for the blue bond as, uh, market as well. And so we've seen some examples, some excellent examples from uh, uh, of blue bonds issued uh, again by the World Bank. Um, so they're leading in that respect, but also from countries like the Seychelles and and the first banks and, and corporates. And very recently, we worked on on two um, um, Icelandic banks who issued a green bond. So not fully blue, but they included for the first time blue assets. So they selected and even also define them specifically as part of their green bond. And I think that focus was very much welcomed by investors. Um, yeah, so in a, in a way, yeah, the seed has, has been planted. And I think with the support of the, of the UN Global Compact uh, guidance documents on blue bonds, that's, that's an excellent basis for, for, for more bonds. And, and that can support also the issuers and the investors in this, this very important goal of, of ocean-based climate solutions. Because I think the appetite is there. Uh, both from the issuers and from the investors, we have to show how it is being done. Um, and so I think the practice, the practicalities is uh, are, are essential. Now to your other question, uh, how can it help investors um, at these specific guidelines? I think the key part in, the, in, in these guys, uh, guideline documents are, are the clear steps and the criteria. Uh, they're very transparent um, guidelines um, and they're based on the on the green bond principles so that's the basis and provides very much um, um, transparency um, topics so that investors can analyze what's what is underneath this kind of, of blue bond uh, strategy um, of course also important is is that the specific un Blue bond targets also um, align with the UN Global Compact and also with the Sustainable Ocean Principles, and so it also gives a direction uh, in the pathway how to to reach this uh, one and a half degree uh, climate goal. And so also that provides confidence to both issuers but also to investors that what they invest is indeed uh, in the right uh, trajectory. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I mean, as you said, once there are some key issuances, and that's what you saw before in the green bond market, then then other other uh, parties start to start to join the market. And it's interesting to hear about the Icelandic banks who've started um, who've issued some green bonds, but with blue use of proceeds. Uh, so so the private sector arm uh, the, the private sector market is is moving on this and then also referring to these clear steps um, in in blue bond guidances and also further developing metrics will be um, so important so I'd like to encourage um, everybody watching today too to look at the blue bond um, guidance the the practical guidances at the global compact I know that you've um, you've been involved in too, and so many of you online have. Uh, thank you very much. So let's let's continue on in this thread, um, going to another part of the finance value chain, and let's move to Tom Eveson, who's the director of sustainable finance solutions for the Americas at Sustainalytics, um, and Sustainalytics is a leading second party opinion provider. Um, but second party opinions give the market assurance that financial instruments that claim to be sustainable are exactly that. And Tom, you know, we've seen kind of a record number of thematic sustainable issuances in this past year, and you scan across a variety of um, a variety of these. So what are you seeing in terms of recent developments in the blue sphere? And also, what are the opportunities that you're seeing now for ocean industries to enter the blue bond market? Tom, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Suzanne. Um, that's great. Um, uh, so yes, to to repeat what you just said, the the momentum and the growth in the whole sustainably themed finance market has I. I is very welcome. I think it's taken the entire industry a little bit by surprise, just the, the rate of uptake uh, and expansion, even from the end of last year into 2021, which is very exciting. Um, the, the, some of the most exciting trends we've seen uh, here at Sustainalytics from all our offices uh, across the world in this, in this lineup is um, the uh, the increase in interest in sustainably linked bonds. And there's a reason I bring this up because the difference between uh, green bond principles, social bond principles, and now sustainably linked bonds is um, the inclusion of setting KPIs as a measurement, uh, as opposed to just use of proceeds, which um, has led to, um, again, continued innovation and continued interest in this space where increasingly um, ourselves and um, our, our other third party provider uh, uh, counterparts um, are all seeing a move to more, a more hybrid approach where a bond can be issued that has use of proceeds as well as KPIs. And that is another increasing trend that we have seen a lot of just over the last two, three months which may be, brings me back to the, the opportunity here for blue bonds, because when you look at the, the five tipping points, some can be um, very clearly defined under um, use of proceeds, where some of the activities, and I would say the, the reduction in GHG emissions and shipping could be um, um, touching on more KPI-based approach. So I, I think using the blue bond uh, guidance documents that uh, your organization has put out and that we rely on heavily, um, we are seeing a lot of appetite for these because they're, 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 it, it, is a, it is a broad, um, it is a broad uh, subsector of industries that this can apply to. So um, I love that this innovation that we've seen is encouraging more and more types of companies to come into this fold. So on that note, we are currently working on and are about to issue two third party opinions on blue bonds. Um, and unfortunately it's capital market based. So I was, was really hoping we'd be over the line and we could uh, announce those at this point, but um, they are imminent um, and the projects have uh, kicked off a, a few weeks ago. So that's any day now, which will be very exciting. Um, and we are seeing uh, my region, I'm more in touch uh, day to day and what's going on in the Americas, but we have seen um, several talks now started on the water infrastructure um, side. So that's very exciting. Um, and I know most of the in, um, banking teams that we speak to have at least brought a company of, of inquiry and then uh, saying, would this fit? Do you think this would be appropriate? So I, I think um, to Mr. Hessel's point, um, absolutely, the first few are going to be the catalyst, and then we will see that um, uh, increase exponentially. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to see that. And um, I, th I think that sort of covers uh, what's going on in this space, but I, I think stay tuned. And uh, within a couple of weeks, we'll have our first corporate issued uh, blue bonds on market, and um, we'll see where that takes us. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. That's really exciting uh, to hear about the momentum and the news that's upcoming in the market. So we're looking forward to that. And it's, it's great working with you. Thank you. Um, so now I'd like to turn a little bit more towards the investor side and, and following the money. And um, clear investor demand is obviously critical to encouraging companies to issue blue and uh, blue investments. So our next speaker is Mr. Scott Mather, who's the Chief Investment Officer of PIMCO's US Core Strategies. And PIMCO is one of the world's largest fixed income investment managers. But Scott also oversees PIMCO's global sustainable investment. So he's got his finger on the pulse beat. And he was um, quite instrumental in feeding in um, input to the Global Compact's Blue Bond reference paper. So Scott, welcome. And uh, how do you see sustainable ocean investments is fitting into the global investor portfolio? And I'd love to hear from your perspective from an investor, what is needed to scale up the blue bond market now? Scott? 
Excellent. Well, <laughs> well, thank you. Happy to uh, share some of my thoughts here. Uh, but let me also first um, congratulate the UN Global Compact and, and the Action Platform uh, for Sustainable Oceans and, uh, and the Blue Road Towards COP26 initiative. Um, you know, we've heard some important comments uh, today from many people and um, from different perspectives and all are really critical uh, to developing this marketplace. And just by way of background, you know, we at PIMCO manage over $2 trillion for all sorts of investors on a global basis. Uh, and we've been very active, as, as you mentioned, in the UN Global Compact and in the um, UN Secretary uh, General's Global Investors for Sustainable Development Alliance. And the reason for that is uh, because we believe that the opportunities around financing the SDGs broadly are absolutely enormous and it can be done in a way that obviously benefits economies and society, but also benefits investors. And so that's why we've been so excited to work with so many partners, uh, many of which uh, are on the call today, including IDB Invest. So, you know, turning to, to oceans uh, specifically, um, you know, many, many more investors, I would say, are now becoming aware of how important and vital the oceans are to economic activity broadly, and not just in the narrow sense, which narrowly defined might be still several trillion of several trillions of dollars annually, but also in the broader context of how important uh, they are to everyone uh, through the interactions with climate and, uh, and global food chains, et cetera. So I think more and more investors from our from our point of view, are understanding that how we invest uh, can have a big impact. And that's really behind this really rapid growth we see in, in the asset class that I call sustainability-linked instruments. And that includes uh, you know, certainly things like green bonds, but also importantly now, blue bonds. And when you look at um, you know, last year's growth in the labeled bond market, it was over 540 billion issued. Uh, in the first quarter of this year, it's over 200 billion issued. So we're approaching, you know, two trillion uh, in in issuance of outstanding issuance. So it's a very large and growing and, and growing asset class, if you will. And what you'll see is, you know, not it's yes, yeah, green bonds are growing rapidly and still make up the bulk of the issuance. But the other categories are growing more quickly. And we think certainly when we look out into the future. Uh, is the other categories that might even turn out to be much larger than the green bond category. So there's really a tremendous opportunity there. And I would say there's every sign that demand is outstripping supply. And you see that when it comes to, to pricing. Uh, we've seen that develop really, especially over the past nine months. And so we believe that trend will continue as more and more investors look at it as we do as an asset class. So I can tell you that that's, that's definitely what's, what's happening. And I think another important uh, thing for issuers to think about is, yes, definitely look at the uh, sustainable ocean principles. And one good reason for doing that is I think it helps um, all sorts of companies who might not immediately know uh, or think about maybe their impact on, on the oceans um, to help define you know, how they are having an impact. And once they do that, they can see the opportunity. Maybe, maybe they can't issue a pure blue bond uh, because it's, you know, they couldn't do it in, in a large enough way to be economically feasible. But they probably are also, they could develop KPIs along all sorts of other sustainability metrics and use the blue ones as a building block. And so by doing that, they could issue a sustainability linked bond. And we think that's a, a tremendous opportunity for even many more companies, many other sovereign issuers who maybe haven't thought about it uh, before. So we just encourage people to really look at those, those resources. And I guess my last message would be, um, and I always bring this, uh, uh, this point up, is we believe strongly in people not letting perfection in this category be the enemy of the good. You know, there's no reason it has to be tremendously complicated. There's a fantastic group of resources that are out there now from the Global Compact and others. And of course, there are large uh, groups of investors, including us here at PIMCO. We're happy to engage with people uh, on their journey and help help them understand what we think would be the most successful way to approach the marketplace. So thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks very much. Yeah, demand outstripping supply. And there's a real desire um, for this kind of for this kind of work. And also, 
using sustainable ocean principles or demonstrating you know, how and being aware of how a company and its strategy interacts with the ocean, but also don't let perfection uh, be the enemy of good. And there is the, you know, in a, in a way it's, um, everything unsustainable is, is about a journey and, and we don't start out with um, perfect. Um, and I think we, we just need to be authentic in our, in our trajectory um, and uh, in, our, in our pathway forward. So um, it's interesting to hear how, how you work with that. Um, thank you very much. We've heard from the investor perspective. So now let's go to an issuer. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Ms. Gerrit Skelberg Ingro, who's the CFO of Kongsberg. And that's the ex those are the experts in ocean technology, particularly around deep sea exploration and maritime technology. And Gerrit, um, CFOs are stewards of trillions of dollars and CFOs are well positioned to ensure that their companies are aligned with the SDGs. So I wondered if you could talk today about this new role of the blue CFO, if you will, um, to support the SDGs and secure a healthy and productive ocean. Um, turning it over to you, Gerrit, please. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for inviting <coughs> the Consper Group. Uh, so dear all the viewers, uh, first of all, I would like to start by echoing what has been said by previous presenters and panelists. There is a massive push for action on climate, and we, we really feel that. Uh, and I think also the will is there. However, there is still a very, very long way to go. Uh, Kongsberg, as a technology provider, we are from deep sea to outer space. We in Kongsberg are at the forefront today and have technology that can push tomorrow's zero emission society. Uh, we provide space technology for illegal fishing. We have technology for zero emission maritime energy solutions. And we also have technology for wind farm applications. Uh, in our business strategy, uh, also actually including all acquisitions, there are initiatives uh, uh, even being, uh, there are no initiatives even being considered if they do not have a clear sustainability plan for future low emission society. Uh, as a CFO, there is no doubt in my mind that the biggest and by far most important catalyst that can make a change uh, that we need globally, it's the flow of capital. The climate issue uh, is global and we need global platforms actually uh, that can solve this issue. The capital markets are one of the most well-proven efficient global systems that we have today. Um, that's why I strongly believe that the established CFO task force as part of the Global Compact Initiative is one of the most important actions where we can see substantial results very, very fast. Uh, the major issue isn't mm. the availability of capital. There is enough capital, both public and private. Public capital has a specific role in being available where there is a non-functioning private market. Hence, for instance, like for research and for development. But there is capital that has uh, that capital, the public capital has long lead time and alone, uh, alone will not be enough to create a rapid change that we need and that we really see that we need today. So in my opinion, we need more flow of private capital. And it was very interesting to hear about the investors here. And the two most important factors to push this in a green direction, I think are the following. First, we need a global climate legislation that creates a push-pull effect for green technology development. The legislation has to be specific as to when they are introduced and have the trust of the capital market. The second one is that we need more efficient allocation of capital to green technology investments. In my short time, I would like to pick up the ladder. 
my experience is that there are both in, uh, institutional and private investors that want to and already have reallocated their investments to green investments. This has entailed that in the two or three last years have been a greenium in the professional capital markets. These blue or green bonds should come with a lower interest rate than ordinary bonds, hence attractive for companies and driving companies to have a prudent framework in line with the blue framework for SDG or EU taxonomy for sustainable finance in order to be qualified to actually have access to those bonds. However, my experience is that the financial margins that are obtained are diluted before they're reaching the end user who is going to make those investments. Kongsberg can put a lot of effort in its sustainability and business strategy. But from a CFO perspective, we need to see clearer financial effects of the work in terms of greeniums that can be utilized for investments in technology development, <clears throat> like, for example, for energy solutions. So this leads to what I really want to address to all the investors out there. If banks don't lower the margins on green bonds, investors must put more pressure on effective allocation when investing in bonds. There needs to be specific demands that lower pri uh, priced capital from a private invest that private investors has placed. They must benefit the end users. So if the private investors are not pushing that, uh, we will not see a lower interest rate on the bonds and it will not come to the end user that are able to invest and benefit from that capital. So uh, if we do so, and if we are able to connect that private capital with a lower interest to do the investments, then I'm very confident that, we'd be, that we will see a stronger push for companies to develop frameworks in order to be qualified for that kind of capital. Thank you so much. Mm, thank you so much. That was really interesting. So um, the benefits or the greenium needs to benefit as well the, the the end users of the capital and that's going to take some collective work by the finance value chain um no but it's something that shows that collectively to move this forward it, it needs to be um an effort by lots of different um lots of different sectors and lots of different stakeholders that was very and then I think there's a lot of private capital out there. There's no interest in the banks at the moment. So it's a really right timing to do so. Great. No, thank you. Thank you. And it's very timely to hear that. Thank you. Um, now, now I'd like to turn for our final speaker to uh, Euronext and Ms. Isabel Usha, who is the CEO of Euronext. Um, that's the largest stock exchange in Europe. And um, Euronext was also the first stock exchange to sign on to the sustainable ocean principles. So Isabel, your job is connecting local economies and industries with global capital markets. Um, and so after hearing what we've just heard from Girid, um, could you share with us um, what stock exchanges can do um, in this spectrum to scale up blue finance? Over to you, Isabel Usha, please. Thank you very much, Susan and, and Eric. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here today and to discuss this topic that is so, so dear to me. Indeed, um, as, as it has already been said, over 3 billion people in the world, that is 40% of the world population, depend on biodiversity and services offered by uh, marine and coastal ecosystems. Uh, and, and this relates to uh, very, a very diverse number of products and services that include food uh, uh, and fresh water supply, renewable energy, um, cultural, uh, uh, so, uh, cultural offer, tourism, trade, transport. So making a major contribution to our economic and, and social development. So oceans and water related activities on our perspective are indeed a sea of opportunities, but need to be protected and developed. So as you just said, Euronext uh, is the leading capital market infrastructure in Europe. We have a presence in 14 uh, European countries and we run uh, the exchange uh, over uh, six countries 
that have very strong ties with uh, ocean and marine life in Portugal, in France, in Belgium, in Holland, in Ireland, in Norway, in Denmark, in Italy very soon, uh, in a few weeks, uh, among others. A and so we realize that in all these countries, we have a strong tradition of uh, fishing and, and aquaculture, for, for example. We have developed uh, 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 significant activity in shipping and, and, and maritime transportation. We have significant coastal and marine tourism op operations. Uh, we have leading ports at global scale, a very important ocean energy generation. And in all these countries, there is a very strong commitment to uh, limit climate change, to protect biodiversity, to fight water pollution. And, and we do want to be part of, of that effort as well. We at Euronext, we estimated that over 200 listed companies are related to ocean and water businesses. So they are either, uh, you know, strongly dependent on str or strongly influencing the world uh, uh, in, in underwater. So the SDG 14 uh, in these different sectors that I have just mentioned. And, and that is more than, or almost two in, in, in each 10 companies that are listed. So it's a very significant, significant number. And, and many of these companies, and we are now developing a, a more precise study on this, but many of these companies already have strong commitments to ocean and water sustainability, but many others are not yet so advanced. Uh, some are very innovative and are developing uh, the solutions of tomorrow. Others are just, you know, starting to, to, to walk the road. And, and we do want to contribute to accelerate uh, this uh, transition effort. And for this, as it was said, we need finance. We need capital markets as, as a critical pillar to find the financing solutions. And we are very committed to, to promote, to develop and to promote uh, um, some of these, uh, some of these uh, solutions. So that's why, and, and you have, uh, uh, I think, mentioned it. Uh, we have adopted the SDG 14, so life below water, as one of our major sustainability uh, goals, and, and that's why we have also engaged with the United Nations uh, Sustainable Ocean Business Group uh, in order to, among other initiatives to uh, develop the UN Blue Bond principles, which were uh, out there in April 2020, and which are now part of uh, Euronext um, ESG bond offering that I will uh, briefly discuss uh, a bit further down. But that is also why we have been the first exchange to sign the UN Global Compact Sustainable Oceans principles, uh, which uh, we think are a very interesting and useful uh, set of um, guidelines uh, if you do want to, to uh, uh, have a meaningful uh, uh, presence and contribution to this major uh, challenge. Uh, and uh, uh, in January this year, we just launched a Euronext Blue Challenge, um, which is a partnership with the Junior Achievement in Europe. It's a student competition that is going on all over uh, the countries that we are in, the, 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 the several countries we are in, and that encourages the new generations, the young, uh, young people to, to find sustainable solutions for the blue economy. So uh, embedding uh, this topic uh, also in the, um, in the generations to come. And now uh, I want to turn into the, the, the bond financing, which is a, a very important topic uh, in this panel today. Um, I, as I mentioned, uh, we have been working to develop this uh, UN uh, blue bond principles um, and uh, Euronext has developed a fully fledged offer on ESG bonds, which are based uh, in, on the ICMA and climate bond uh, standards, uh, but which match uh, very well, which tie very well with these UN bond, bond principles. So we have a dedicated segment to uh, so under this umbrella of uh, our ESG bonds, we have uh, green bond offer, social bond offer, sustainability bond offer, and sustainability linked bonds, uh, which have been already highlighted here. And, of, and, and we also have a section for, uh, for, for blue bonds, which uh, we are uh, strongly promoting and, and hoping that it will be uh, filled with, 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 with issues uh, uh, soon. 
And, and we are very pleased to highlight that there has been a strong increase in demand for these products. Just to give you uh, two figures, uh, in, in 2020, we have reached over 550 listed ESG bonds, uh, which correspond to almost uh, 300 billion of uh, financing. And, and this amount has doubled to the 2019 figures, which had doubled from the 2018 figures. So it's, it's been really a, a tremendous uh, uh, growth path. Uh, and we are very uh, enthusiastic about it because this is really on, 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 on the right path and on the right way to support all these this challenges that, that we have. And it's also very uh, uh, relevant to highlight that this total ESG uh, bond issuance has reached 10% of the total bond issuance in Europe, which is also a remarkable uh, achievement. And we are very proud to have um, uh, listed about 20% of all uh, the world uh, ESG bonds at our Euronext markets. But the UN Blue Bond Principle uh, ties very well, as I said, with this uh, ICMA principle for the, for the, uh, for the ESG uh, bonds. And so by combining this, the standards and the guidelines, uh, this, will, uh, this is building a very, uh, I would say, compelling framework that investors, I think, can trust and, wisher, and, and, and issuers can benefit from. So we have, uh, we, we are a strong supporter and, and, and we are uh, very willing to, to, to um, promote and to um, inform on, on, this, on this offer. So we are very confident that the UN bond principles will be a relevant tool to the transition to a net zero economy and accelerate the financing of the ocean-based solutions. We believe that there is a sea, as I said, a sea of opportunities in the blue economy, and Euronext uh, is in the, in the forefront to support and help to finance the blue future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's, it's great to see that you've opened up a section for, for blue bonds, and, and you're right, blue bonds do, um, tie in with globally accepted standards such as the ICMA uh, sustainability or green bond standards um, and um, and that you are prepared for growth and the growth that you've seen in these thematic bonds um, and are looking to see in blue bonds. So thank you so much to the panel and for talking about the role of private finance in, in benefiting the the um, blue economy. And also thank you very much to IDB Invest and Mr. Scriven for co-hosting this event with us. I'd like to turn the floor back now to my colleague, Eric, um, for some final reflections on today. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you all uh, panelists and speakers of the, this joint event between the UN Global Compact and IDB Invest. It's our annual World Bank Spring Meeting side event. This time it's uh, virtual. Next time, hope to see you all in person. All four, five hundred. I don't know how many we were at the most. Uh, key takeaways: I think there is a great appetite for sustainable investments, both from public and private investors. There is a need for a clearer guidance on how to understand what's green and what's blue and what's not. Uh, you, we have the sustainable ocean principles, and we have the very useful practical guidances. That's all on the website, but that takes industry by industry, showcasing what is the expected standard for each industry to deliver in a sustainable manner. We know with the upcoming COP26, with the upcoming EU taxonomy, there will be significant discussions going on. We invite all of you to take part in the UN Global Compact work streams on these critical issues as CFOs or sustainability or as CEOs of your companies, because now the roadmap is being drafted and designed. And in November, we are setting sail for a more sustainable ocean business. So please join us in that journey. Great seeing all of you, great talking to all of you and looking forward to see you again soon. Thank you so much for taking part. Bye-bye.